My name is uh, Jesse Lures. I go by Doi Online. Uh, and this talk, and this, does this not have a microphone? No microphone. No. Okay, so this, <clears throat> this talk is about um, dependency injection using the breadboard framework. Um, to get started, I kind of want to start with a uh, motivating example. Oh, there we go. Um, to kind of explain the kinds of problems that breadboard is intended to solve. <laughs> um, so you start with you have you have your web application here. Um, I don't know if you can read that very well, but it's, it basically just connects to a database, pulls out some information, and then renders it into some kind of template file um, with some logging thrown in there and everything. And so you, this this works fine. But if you want to start doing things like testing it, you probably want to be able to maybe switch out the model for, for a test database or something like that so it's not always connecting to the same database. Uh, so you, you might want to pull some of, the, some of your um, objects out into attributes using like a, a Moose kind of design. Um, this way you can swap out the model. You can, um, it's, it's more easily extensible. Um, move the logger into the, the places where it's actually used in, in the model in the view. Um, <clears throat> but having the logger not available, having to initialize the logger multiple times can be a problem sometimes. Um, you want you want to you want to initialize it with a certain amount of configuration maybe, and you want to do that in one place. So you pull the logger out into its own attribute and then pass it into the model in the view. And this makes it more flexible, so you can just configure the logger in one place and then use it globally, even though it's not um, actually a, a global, because globals have their own kind of issues. Um, the application still stays basically the same. Um, and as, as your application grows, you t start to want to add more configuration options to it. You can swap out just the DSN to initialize the model uh, more more conveniently, so you don't have to create a new one all on your own if there's more things that it requires, um, you temp the template root, um, things like that. But as, as this kind of grows, you, the, the amount of kind of manual passing things around that you have to do gets more and more and more complicated. Um, and this, this starts to kind of overwhelm the, the benefits that you get by having a, a good structure for your application just by having to deal with all the little fiddly details that this kind of brings along. And so the, the solution here that the, the dependency injection is basically what solves this problem. It, it, it provides a solution for, for handling all of the passing around of all, all of this data. So dependency injection is a form of inversion of control. It basically takes control of your, your application, um, and you provide information to tell it how to configure things. It's, it's referred to as the inverse of garbage collection sometimes. Basically, garbage collection handles how your objects are destroyed, um, you don't, so you don't have to think about that at all. Uh, dependency injection lets you tell the dependency injection system how your objects should be created, and then you can just go and ask it, how, ask it for an, an object, and it'll just give it to you. It'll figure out all the details. You don't have to do any of the manual passing around or anything like that. Um, it's, it's all exactly, it's all consistently done. Um, and yeah, it manages, you, manages the construction of your objects for you. Um, some of the benefits you get here, the, you, when you have multiple places that need to have access to the same object, so you have your web application maybe, but you might also have things like um, database reporting scripts or things you might want to send email to people to get, uh, and you, you need to get access to different parts of your application. Um, making sure that all of your objects are initialized in the same way every time is, is very useful. Uh, and dependency injection provides this by providing a, a, a consistent interface to make sure no matter what part of your application you're accessing, it's always initialized in the same way. It does this in a way that doesn't need globals. You don't have to, you, you don't have to deal with all of the issues that globals can, can cause, um, the, the wide scope of, of places that might go wrong during debugging and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, and also just makes testing and reuse a lot easier because you can swap out different parts of the structure. 
um, without affecting how everything is passed around. If you, if you have, for instance, your logger being initialized in, in a hard-coded um, thing in your application, you can't necessarily swap out for a test logger, which just stores the log information instead of printing it. Uh, you'd have to go into your application and all the places where you use the logger, change the, the class name and, and things like that. Um, or provide or have each part of your application be configurable separately, which is a lot of duplicated effort. So uh, one, one example that you might be familiar, of, familiar with for dependency injection, Catalyst um, includes a, a kind of a simple dependency injection system. Um, so you have, for instance, you, you, call, you call the model method. Uh, and it, it figures out how to create a model object for you based on your configuration. Um, it's not very, um, it, it's, it's pretty limited because the only thing it can really do is, is create objects of those specific types. You have, you have hard-coded types in, in the object. And I mean, it's, it's extensible, but it, it's still a, a fixed set of things that can create. And it can only create things from the, the configuration. You can't have, it, it's more difficult to do things that depend on each other and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so breadboard is kind of a more flexible way to wire your objects together. This is a breadboard. Um, this is, this is kind of what a, a typical breadboard um, setup looks like. Uh, it consists of a bunch of different parts. You have containers and services, and I'm gonna go over what all this stuff means, um, but this, this is just kind of an, an overview of what it's gonna look like. So, the, the, the basic component for, for, a, for a breadboard uh, setup is the service. The service is, is actually what represents each individual piece of data that you're storing, you're typically like an object or something like that. Um, you, there, there's a method on the, on the service that'll give you a new copy of that object, typically by um, just creating it from the constructor. Um, and there, there are, but there are, three, there are three different ways to create uh, ob objects from services. So you have uh, constructor injection, which is the simplest form. You just give it a class name and it knows to just call new on that class and, and return whatever the object was that was, that was returned. Um, you can use a block injection where you just have it run some kind of subroutine and just return whatever that, that subroutine returns. And there's also a, a literal service where you can just give it some, some fixed data and it'll just return that data every time. Uh, the next component that, that uh, Breadboard has is, is called a container. Container uh, holds all the services and uh, other subcontainers to provide sort of the, the overall structure for, for the, the, the Breadboard system. Um, you can access the contents of a container, either another container or a service via a method call. Um, and there's a shortcut so you can just say, I want, the, I want to get the service out of this container and then get the data out of the service. And this is typically how you interact with it. Um, <clears throat> because services, or because uh, containers can have subcontainers, you can ask, you, there, there's a, a way to specify which service, where you want to look for your services. You do this by specifying something that's basically like Unix paths. Um, it, the relative paths are relative to the current container. Absolute paths go up to the parent. It's, it's all pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and so the, the, the key piece of functionality that Breadboard adds to, to, to do what it does, basically, is through dependencies. Dependencies tells Breadboard how your classes are related. Um, which parts of your application depend on which other parts. You can you specify this as just mapping a dependency name to some other service that you've already defined. Um, and yeah, relative paths are relative to the container that contains the service. So here we have a service defined with dependencies. Here the, the view depends on the logger. What this means is that when you ask for the, the view service, 
it will go and create a view object by calling new on, on the view class, but it'll also pass the logger as, as a parameter. So it'll say logger um, goes to, the, it'll, and it'll resolve the logger service to find out what to pass. Um, you can do more complicated things. Uh, here, here's how you would do it with a block injection. Uh, you specify the DSN as a dependency, and you can pass in the, the, the block receives the service object with all of the dependencies already resolved, and you can just access them directly to pass them however you need to. Like here, if there's a custom constructor that you, a custom constructor that you need to um, work with, you can just do it this way. Uh, and this can get as complicated as, as, you, as you need to. Uh, this, this abstracts the model data into its own separate subcontainer, and then you just access it. Um, you can just access whatever parts you need without having to um, pollute the, the, the namespace of the top level container. Um, parameters are basically, are, are the next kind of thing that Breadboard has, and they're basically um, the same kind of concept as dependencies. They're, they're, how, they're, they're how you specify different parts of the application, of the application that, that, needs, that need to be specified. Instead of having them already encoded in the breadboard structure, um, they're supplied by you when you try and resolve the service. So here, instead of depending on a name uh, dependency, uh, or having the, a dependency on a name service, uh, you have a name parameter, which you then pass into the to the call to resolve. Um, you can do um, you can depend on services with, with parameters by just passing the parameters into the, de the dependency specification, uh, just like like uh, here, and you can. Um, You can you can and um, or or you can depend on the service directly and then pass in the dependency um, inside the block itself by using the the inflate call there. If you if you depend on on a service which has unfulfilled uh, parameters, it'll return like a, a kind of special object that you have to then inflate with the parameters to get the actual object that you, that you need. Um, but there, there, so there's a lot of different ways that these kind of things can, can interact in, in whatever way you need to. <clears throat> um, you can have optional parameters. Parameters can have type constraints. Um, parameters can have defaults. And, um, and yeah, so you can get different, different kinds of ways to, to access different, different pieces of, of information. And parameters interact with dependencies in, in a same kind of way. You can specify, um, if you have an optional parameter that also has a dependency, you can have the default instead be resolved through a dependency rather than a hard-coded default. Um, and so that, that's basically how you, you manage. Th those are the kind of ways to manage your data. Life cycles are, are one more component that, that basically tell you how you resolve um, services. So by default, each time you call get on a service, you create a, a new object each time. If you s instead specify a singleton life cycle, every time you call get on the service, you will get the same object back. This is kind of a, an alternative, instead of using singleton classes, which you run into problems when you might actually need more than one of them in your application. If you instead specify them as singleton services, um, the class doesn't have to know anything about how it's going to be used or, or um, anything like that. You can just have it as, as a singleton service and you'll always, it'll act like a singleton if you access it through breadboard. But if you do happen to actually need a more need more than one of them for some specific part of your application, or if you need to be running more than one thing at once, um, you can add non-singleton services for the same class, um, and that, that provides a lot, a lot more flexibility in that way. So, um, this, so here, here's the, the uh, original example that I showed earlier. Uh, you can kind of see how this all fits together now. Um, you have the, the um, app, the application, which depends on the, the model and the, and the view. 
the model, which is a block injection, which depends on the logger and the, and the DSN. The DSN is a, is a um, literal service, and the logger is a, a, class, is a singleton class service, uh, and then the view is just a, a regular class service, which also depends on the logger. And so here, you can just, it, it, when you resolve the app, it goes through and it's, it fulfills all the dependencies recursively and provides all of the, passes around all of the data that's necessary for each individual component of your application. Um, one of the more interesting features that, that Breadboard has uh, that's, that's kind of built on top of the, the system is, uh, it's called type maps. It basically, once you have a service, you can define a mapping from a, a class type type constraint to that service. And then instead of re requesting a particular service when you are resolving something, you can instead request an, an object of a particular type. Um, this is kind of useful on its own, but the more interesting part is that if you are using types, if you have a type map for, for all of the components of your application, a lot of times you can just infer what the dependencies actually should be for, for, each, for each service. And th this, will, this will simplify a lot of the, the configuration that you'd otherwise need to do. Um, here we have a, a container which has two, two, um, two, service, two services here. The infer, it basically automatically creates a service and automatically figures out the dependencies. So, and it does this by looking through your, your Moose class, introspecting the attributes and looking at the type constraints to see if there's any types in that class that match up with types that you've defined in your, in your type map. So here the logger doesn't have any attributes, so it just turns into a regular constructor injection service. But the model has a logger attribute, which, which has a, is a logger. So it has a logger type constraint. It looks in the type map, sees that we have a logger already in the type map, and it just automatically knows that you want to have that be a dependency. So the, the way this kind of works is that any, any, any attribute that is required in your classes, when you, when you go and use the type inference, it automatically, or dependency inference, it automatically becomes um, a dependency or a parameter if it's not in the type map. Uh, this way you can, you can specify it later. Um, for non-required attributes, um, you, can, you can either specify it as a parameter, it's, it's, it's available to be specified as a parameter, uh, and you can also manually add it to the dependency list um, if, if you want it to actually be a dependency. And so if you want to rewrite that original example using um, type maps instead, this is, this is a, lot, a lot simpler of, of a structure. You don't have the my app, the, the, the application object is just automatically figured out. Um, it, it, has, it has attributes for the model and the view, and so you don't have to actually specify that. The model, um, is the model has a dependency on the DSN, which isn't a, which isn't a class. So you have to actually specify these manually um, and specify the, the blocks so that it knows how to deal with the custom con, custom constructor. But once you have that service, you can just add the model to the type map and have it be used as a type later on. If you need to depend explicitly on a typed on a, on a typed service instead of a, a named service, you use the the type the type colon prefix there instead. Um, you can pass any kind of service constructor parameters, like uh, for the logger, we pass lifecycle singleton to make sure it's a, a singleton service that's created. Um, but it, it, it basically removes a lot of the repetitive um, specifications of things that you'd otherwise have to use. Um, so, Going back to what I was talking about with, with Catalyst earlier, uh, Catalyst is actually trying to move towards using Breadboard instead of their own kind of homegrown solution. Um, right now, I'll, they just have a, a plugin that you can use, which, which will uh, allow you to specify your Catalyst configuration as a Breadboard container instead, um, which would, if you have that um, written as an external container, you can then use that um, in other external scripts to initialize 
your objects using the same, the same data that Catalyst will, will use in, in, um, in, in its internals. Um, but there is work being done to actually move breadboard into the Catalyst core to, to be used as its actual um, dependency resolution, dependency injection kind of system. Um, but that, that's, uh, I think Florian is, is the one working on that. Um, so now, now that we've kind of got an idea of how breadboard works, um, I kind of want to go into some sort of best practices for what, how, how, you, how you use it. One, one of the most important um, things, and one of the things that people get confused about a lot, is that the um, breadboard containers, the dependency injection in general, is a, it's an application initialization. Um, that, that, that's, what it's, that's what it's for. A lot of people, when, when you, um, it, a lot of people will see that they have, they're creating a lot of other kinds of objects at runtime. Um, but if, if you, and, and they might want to try and use breadboard to create those kind of objects too. The trouble you run into here is that if you're, if you're using your breadboard container at runtime in your application, you basically eliminate all of the benefits that you've just gotten from using dependency injection in the first place because now your breadboard container is just another kind of God object. And that's not, that, 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 that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, what you want to really do is use breadboard to create the, the general structure of your application, all the pieces that, that are tied together um, at the start. If you need to create things at runtime and you want this to be more pluggable and stuff like that, the container can create factory classes, factory, factory objects for you. This, this, they don't even have to be factory objects. Uh, I mean, closures, closures work just fine as factories if you need something simple. Um, but this, this will allow you to keep the, the parts of your um, application separate, um, which is kind of a lot of the point of, of Breadboard. It, it, it lets you keep your, your application separated enough that um, in, in a way that's not really tedious. Another, um, oh, whoops, the subtitle here is wrong. But the, another really good kind of best practice for using breadboard is in, instead of writing the containers just directly as, a, as, a, as an object with the, with the creating as a, as a variable, you can create container classes where you subclass breadboard container. One, one of the main um, design points for, for breadboard is that every part of it is, is very extensible. Uh, you, can, you can subclass containers, you can create new kinds of services, you can create new kinds of life cycles. Um, creating new kinds of containers is, is one of the more, is, is one of the most common ways to do this. You create a new container that will initialize your, um, initialize itself directly through, through a, a build method. Um, if you pass an, an already existing breadboard container as the first parameter to the container sugar, um, it will append to that container instead of, instead of creating a new one. So here you can just put all of your configuration inside the build method and then you just have to call new on your, on your, on your container. Like here it just creates an, a new subcontainer directly instead of having to specify the whole configuration. This is, this is very useful, especially if you want to be sharing containers between projects or between different, um, different parts of your project. This becomes, it, it's still kind of ugly to do this all in, in build and, and that sort of thing. So one of, the, one of the projects that kind of makes this simpler um, is called Breadboard Declare. What this does is it kind of maps services to Moose attributes. So instead of uh, defining services, the, pro the problem with just defining services is that they're still kind of hard to um, swap out. You have to actually edit the breadboard configuration if you want to swap out different parts of it, um, which makes it easier to not have to edit a lot of different parts of your application, but there's still some place that's not as configurable. And so you can, you could either manually create a, um, have the service be defined by some method calls on, on, your, on your custom container class, or you can um, just, just do this, basically. Um, this ties, um, this allows you to specify all of the 
breadboard service configuration as attribute parameters, um, and then just use your use your class as um, a, a container uh, directly. So services are declared just by defining attributes. Attribute accessors resolve the service if there's no value. Um, so if, if you don't pass a value into the constructor, it just um, resolves the service as normal. But if the attribute does have a value and you're in the middle of resolving a service and it wants to resolve a service that maps to an attribute, it will take the value that you provided for that attribute instead. So this will allow you to swap out different parts really easily by just passing them into the constructor and then they'll just be used in your whole uh, dependency resolution process. So for instance, in the, uh, in, in the example I, that I just showed you, you can just pass in the uh, DSN as a constructor parameter, and then when, you, when the model is resolved by just calling the, the model accessor method, um, it will just be using the new DSN automatically. Um, Redboard Declare also makes type maps a lot simpler. Um, it automatically just infers how the type map should be set up by the type constraints on your attributes. So if you declare an attribute that, that is a view, it will figure out that you want to be adding that, uh, that service to the type map with the, with the class of view. Um, and then if you specify infer, um, it will automatically do all, all, all the type inference for that, for that uh, service. So if you, this, this way you can, um, where was I? This way you can um, have services that have both a type and a name so you don't have to use the weird kind of type colon type name syntax for depending on, on um, other services. Um, and you can also just specify both infer and dependencies to specify dependencies that you might otherwise need to specify manually. Um, so one of the, one of the projects that, that, I, that I've been working on that uses breadboard declare um, is ox. Ox is a web framework that um, I've been working on for, for, for a while, which basically uses Breadboard Declare as, as its um, sugar and configuration layer, basically, with a few extra pieces added on. So here, all the stuff at the top is just normal Breadboard Declare class. It specifies all the pieces of your application that, that, that are necessary. Um, and you can, and then you can specify a router to specify how, um, how the incoming requests are routed. And so in this case, what, what, this, what this router syntax means basically is that it looks for the controller service and then calls the index method on it, passing it only the request object for, for that request. Um, anything else that you need to handle the request is already resolved for you by dependency injection. This way there doesn't need to be like um, Catalyst's context object that's passed around everywhere. There doesn't need to be the, the com controllers and all the different parts of your application don't need to have access to the entire application, uh, which simplifies the scope of what you're doing a lot. All of these classes are just normal Moose classes. The only, the only thing special about controllers is that they have methods which, which expect to receive a request object. Um, everything else is just normal Moose class. All of the different components, these components aren't even, there, there's no necessity to use um, MVC kind of structure. These, these names are just conventions. You can, you can use whatever you want here. Um, the, only, the only kind of requirement for, for Ox is that it has an, an app service which can be resolved to get a, a PSGI application out of it. And it, it's run, it runs entirely on, on PSGI. And so this, this simplifies things a lot just because there doesn't need to be an explicit kind of plugin system for it. Um, you can just use, you can just write, write your Moose classes the way you normally would. You can have dependencies that are just 
a, a, a template object, for instance, instead of having to use something that wraps it like Catalyst View TT, that, that sort of thing. Um, you don't have, you can use like Kyoku X model or um, Divis class schema, like those sort of things just directly. There doesn't need to be as much boilerplate just to try and get all the different CPAN things that you already use all the time, just to get them to work with, with the application framework. Uh, and so once you have your application described here, all you really have to do is you can call to app on it. This will resolve the app service and give you a PSGI application. Um, but you can also just access individual pieces of the application directly. Uh, and this is, this is where it comes in really useful for um, if you have, say, database, like scripts that need to access the database, you can have those scripts just use your model directly by instantiating the application object and then only resolving the model portion. This ensures that it's always accessing the exact same model that you would get um, by when, but when you run your application as a whole. Um, but you don't have to have the whole application running in order to have access to it. This is one of the big things that is really annoying to do in Catalyst because there's not really a way to get at for instance, a, a Catalyst model without um, initializing the, the entire application. Um, and so here's kind of um, a little more of a in-depth example. It has a logger and all these things are inferred. Um, and yeah. So, um, does anyone have any, any questions about any of this? Yeah. Um, I'm just discovering this Java world and OSGI. How does it relate to OSGI? Is it to, to what? kind of fork of OSGI or is it the same model? I'm not, I'm not sure. What, what are you asking? OSGI. OS, OSGI? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's based on, on it, it, not necessarily based on, but it's been inspired by a, uh, other dependency injection systems in other languages. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Um, any, anyone else? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the, the question was just why, why should I be using the dependency injection instead of just why, why should I not be doing my instead of just doing it by hand basically um, because that's a lot of effort <laughs> I mean it, it just saves me a lot of time if I can just start with this and know that no matter how big my application grows, it's not going to get out of hand kind of having to deal with making sure everything is in place. I mean, basically the same sort of reasoning behind why am I using Moose instead of just writing the objects by hand. I mean, it, it's, it's, what? Oh, and I guess, I guess why you use garbage collection instead of manually handling objects. Like there, there, it, yeah, like, like it, it's just another level of abstraction. It's not, it, the, the, the benefits aren't usually apparent for smaller projects. It, it's, it's really, for a smaller projects, it doesn't really matter how, like I was showing in the, in the beginning example, um, you can have simple applications that, that don't need any of this. But having the ability there to, to expand more easily without having to kind of re-architecture a lot of different things is, is very useful. Yeah. Uh, um, I have a very complicated um, application, uh -huh. which is global code base for 40 countries. Which is, um, I, I, can't, I can't hear you, <laughs> sorry. I have a global code base uh -huh. for 40 different countries. Uh -huh. Each country has a different configuration. Okay. So um, at the moment, I have all the contact terms for each country and for every work request, and there are quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh -huh.
Um, so, so, yeah, so, so the, the question is, is just um, that if you have a lot of different configurations that, that you need for, um, like you have for, for, different, for different countries, need different configurations for things, basically. Um, and instead of instantiating things from the configuration each time, is there a way to use dependency injection to handle that? Is that, is that basically what you're asking? Right. Yeah, so, so one, one, of the, one of the nice things about um, Breadboard Declare in particular is that it still does work just like a Moose class. You can have subclasses, you can have roles that, that handle specific um, configuration needs for specific things. You can have different Breadboard containers for each of your different, um, for each of the, the different countries, I guess, in your case. Um, that, that do things slightly differently, but they're all inheriting from the same base container. Um, and and that, 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 works, that works really well. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Um, so, generally speaking, for a while, people have had capitalist applications which have loads of models. Right. And you, we try to make them as thin as possible in the capitalist. So right. Adapt as much as possible in the Right, right, right. When you said about how um, this would allow you to reach into Catalyst and use models that are in there without using the entire Catalyst application, mm -hmm. it kind of implies that it would kind of be grouped together. My question is, could you envision a way that you could have your application where it's not really a Catalyst application, but Breadboard has made Catalyst the dependency for the context within which you're using your application, so that Catalyst becomes like the dependency? Yeah, there's the catalyst maintainer, so he can answer that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that, I, 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 imagine, I imagine that once, once Catalyst starts using breadboard, those kind of things will be a lot, a lot more straightforward. Uh, anything else? All right, thanks.